My name is Donna Joseph, president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Eta Omega Omega Chapter, Bronx, New York. And with the upcoming fierce election, um, I'm glad we have this opportunity with Senator Jamal Bailey so that the community can get an opportunity to get some questions to a myriad of issues answered today. So thank you for joining us today. At this time, I will turn it over to our connection chairman, member Donna Kay. Uh, good afternoon, members. First, I would like to introduce this vibrant young man to the community. Senator Jamal T. Bailey represents New York's 36th State Senate District, which covers the Bronx neighborhoods of Norwood, Bedford Park, Williamsbridge, Co-op City, Wakefield, Baychester, and, West, and the Westchester City of Mount Vernon. Gosh, that's a lot. Um, he was elected to the state Senate on November 8th, 2016. Prior to his election, he served as Assembly Speaker Carl Hastings, Community Relations Director after having served as District Leader of the 83rd Assembly District for six years. He attended PS 83, in Morris Park, MS 181 in Co-op City, and excelled at the Bronx High School of Science and went on to the University of Albany. As a college senior, Senator Bailey began his career in government as an intern for Carl Hasty. Senator Bailey is a dedicated family man who lives it with his wife, I apologize, sir, Diamara, and their two lovely daughters in the Baychester section of the Bronx. He continues to live out the advice of his family that one can only get out of their community what they put in. On October 6, 2020, Senator Bailey was elected to serve as the Bronx Democratic Party Chairman. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Now I will turn over to Member Dion Let's. Thank you. And welcome, Senator Bailey. Thank you. And um, once again, welcome, Senator Bailey. I want to thank you for taking the opportunity to sit with us and um, help us just get an idea of what brought you here today and what you're looking for as far as uh, future vo voting opportunities. So our first question for you is, what moved you to become involved in politics and seek an elected position? Well, you know, and one, well, let me first and foremost say thank you for inviting me. Um, Donna talks about the district, but Donna served quite well under the, on the, in, in, the, in, the, in the role of do everything. You know, it wasn't a specific job, but in government, that's our job, it's a catch-all, do everything for uh, the Honorable Ruth Hassel Thompson, and, and, and Donna knows this district like the back of her hand. So let's make sure we give credit where it's due for your service in the state, Donna. Let's 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 also make sure that um, you know we all stand on the shoulders of giants, and you're one of those giants that we stand on the shoulders of. So thank you. Make sure head no, but anybody that knows anything about state government knows it ain't Don Drake, right? So let's just, <laughs> let's let's, let, let's, let, let's let's be real. Let's um, be real. Yes. <laughs> right? so, how did I get involved in this? Um, I've always had an interest in, in the way things work and caring about my community. And again, senior year of, uh, at the University of Albany, I had the opportunity to be a member of the internship, uh, the assembly internship program. And um, I, I had a chance to intern with my local assembly member, a gentleman that I'd heard of. He was the second term, term assemblyman at the time, a gentleman by the name of Carl Hasty. He was a, a younger assembly member. He was somebody that always wanted to make sure that he had somebody from his district to intern in his office. And that was something that he gave to the, uh, the assembly internship committee. So, you know, I, I walked into the, to the assembly internship and I was like, you know what? I, I didn't know what to expect. And I went to Carl that day and I, and I'm, I don't know, I don't know him really. I'd see him. I'd just say, Hey, Mr. Hasty, I just want to, you know, I want to learn. I'm here to learn. I don't want to do something. Do you need some coffee, some, some whatever, whatever. He's like three things. One, my name is Carl, not Mr. Hasty. Two, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, with, with getting coffee or anything like that, but you're here to learn. And three, I don't drink coffee. I like tea. So this is what you're here for, right? 
So like I, from, from that moment on, it was a good experience where I was able to immerse myself fully, I actually got a chance to, um, to draft legislation as an intern. I got to go to conference and committees and things that interns really weren't doing uh, because Carl took me under his wing. And that shows one, the, the importance of mentoring, um, that, that, that mentoring is critical and making sure that, you, that there are people who are going to be able to see things in you that you can't see. And it's our job as people, as thought leaders or leaders in our communities to ensure that we're bringing um, somebody along. And that doesn't mean necessarily younger. People tend to think that mentoring has to be an older to younger. You can mentor peers. Um, you can mentor people that are older than you, right? So mentoring is like, we tend to think of it as a, as a one way older to younger, Obi-Wan Kenobi type of thing, right? It's, it's not that. It can be, it can be that, but it can be many different things. So that's, that, that's, I got bit by the political bug and I just kind of stayed, <laughs> stayed involved and, um, you know, I was able to, I, I, you know, by the grace of God and, 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 and by, the, by the grace of good mentorships and people who cared enough about me and the community to make sure that I stayed involved, even when things were, um, were, were tough. Um, I, I'm, that's why I, I, you know, I'm, I'm here today, so. Thank you for that. Um, as an educator, I see my students as being their mentor. It's very rare that I think of the concept of, um, you know, mentoring someone older than myself or someone younger than myself mentoring me. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, going forward, what is the role and responsibility of the Bronx Democratic Chairman? So it's an honor, it's a, a incredibly huge honor to have been selected by as the Democratic Par County Party Chair. So I guess I can go into a little bit about how that takes place and, and what that takes place. So there are 24 district leaders and, and district leaders are elected uh, male and female in each assembly district in the Bronx, uh, with the exception of the 82nd. The 82nd has two different parts. They have a part A and a part B because of the, the nature of the assembly district um, was that it was, it's broken up by the water. So you have a Throgs Neck Common Bay side and you have the Co-op City side, which is part A and part B respectively. Um, so um, in each district, you have a total of, you have a male and a female district leader. And the male and the female district leaders, they, they are a part of what the, the, is considered to be the executive committee of the Democratic County Committee in the Bronx. And um, a, a majority of district leaders um, must, must vote for you in addition to the votes in the executive committee, uh, which are uh, the first vice chair, parliamentarian, uh, treasurer, council, uh, and sergeant at arms. Those are the voting, those are the voting members, members, um, I believe those, I, I believe those are all, all the voting members uh, of, the, um, of, of the county committee. So they create the, they, they, they are able to vote for the executive, the chair of the executive committee, which is what I am now. And the role of the, of the chair of the executive committee is nebulous in some ways. It, it, it means a lot of different things. It means that you're, you, you are the head of the, um, the Democratic Party in the borough of the Bronx. Um, you are um, charged with trying to win elections and, and, and bring people back into the fold, so to speak. But to what it means to me, it means to look at a, what is an overwhelmingly democratic uh, borough. And sometimes I know we don't do things by, um, by in a partisan nature. And I wanna thank the AKAs for, for participating in so many nonpartisan voter registration drives because those are critical. But just putting a partisan lens on for a second, um, uh, the Bronx is overwhelmingly democratic and it will remain so for quite some time. Actually in 2016, the Bronx, New York was the third greatest turnout county in the United States of America when it came to voting for Democrats and the president. Not in the city, not in the state, the country. The Bronx was number three in the country. We are a wow. solid blue, a uh, very solidly blue um, borough. So what does that mean though, right? Uh, all blue, all, there are different hues of blue, so to speak, right? There are different Democrats who believe in different things. And quite frankly, that's okay. One of the greatest things about democracy, in my opinion, is in fact dissent. Despite what we may think and the way we may go about things, none of us know everything. And it's important to understand and have a worldview that, that, that encapsulates that. I don't know everything about every community. I know my district well. I don't know every district in the South Bronx as well or the West Bronx. I don't know every district well. So I rely on a couple of things. I rely on the, the, the community leaders on the ground to tell me what's happening. And I rely on my elected colleagues in government to also tell me this is what's happening. And it's kind of figuring out, putting the pieces together of a very complicated puzzle that range from economic disparities to ethnic disparities, 
to um, policy belief disparities. For example, in my district, the Northeast Bronx in the city of Mount Vernon, um, the, which, are, which has the lion's share of the population of my district, um, are homeowners. Um, they are largely owner-occupied homes. And if they rent, they have tenants in, the, in an owner-occupied home and I have co-op city. In the Northwest portion of my Bronx, the Bronx of my district, part of my district is more tenant friendly. So when people have the proposition of cancel rent, for example, right? Just, just to put that out there. When people say cancel rent, I believe that based upon what's happened with COVID-19, we should figure out some way to alleviate the concerns of renters, absolutely. However, we have to also ensure that homeowners, uh, those own occupied homes, those are cooperators in co-op city and those homeowners in the city of Mount Vernon are also given some sort of relief. Those are the kind of, and I use that as a way to say, we're always not going to figure, we're always not going to necessarily say at the beginning, these are aligned outcomes. But I believe that I have the temperament and the personality and the demeanor, and most importantly, the relationships to be able to say, you're here, you're here, let's get here. Wow, thank you. So with all of that, that definitely sounds like a huge responsibility on your end. And thinking of this responsibility with these vast responsibilities as serving as New York State Senator and Chairman of the Senate Codes Committee, why would you choose to serve as the chairman of the Bronx Democratic Party? I ask myself that every day. <laughs> no, no, quite frankly, I, I think it's, it's, it's quite an opportunity. Uh, it's, I'm a Bronx boy. Right? And, 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 and again, I always want to make sure that my constituents in Mount Vernon know I love them just as much as I do my, 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 my Bronx constituents. And, and, and I want to make sure that, that that's crystal clear. But ultimately, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a kid from the Bronx and being able to try to unify the borough is something that I think that, you know, I, I can do. I think that it's a task that will not be easy, um, but I think that it's I think it's worth it. I think that it is um, something that um, that I would be able to with the help of a lot of people, of course, um, sometimes we, we elected officials, we get we say the word I too much. And if we're not talking about our site, um, we have to be mindful of what I actually means. I may be the, the face of the Democratic Party or the face of the 36th Senatorial District, but make no mistake about it, as Donna can tell you, that if you don't have a great staff behind you in any capacity, you, sure. you, you simply are doomed. You have to have a staff that not only is competent, and but but they can pick up where you've left off and they can fill in for you sometimes and i'm grateful to have an incredible staff an incredible support system so um and not straying too far away from from what you from what you said i i believe that togetherness the understanding that only we can take care of us is one of the reasons why i, I decided to take this role on um with the understanding that it that it is a um it is. It has to be one of, uh, of 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 I don't. I don't want to say galvanizing too much, but I think that's what it is, right? It is. I, I, I have to bring people together using the skills that I have, while relying on uh, a whole network of people within and outside of government to to ensure that we are moving things in a different direction. Because I think. Quite frankly, people are, are, are tired of, of, of things as usual. Um, people want things that are different. We're not, I'm not saying make change for the sake of making change because you're not really making change. You're just reshuffling the chairs on the deck of the Titanic, so to speak, right? Um, but what are, what are you going to do to actually move the ball, the needle? And for me, it's about incremental change. It's about trying to figure out how do you get more diversity and inclusion sure while also increasing the quality of our representation because i'm not a box check kind of guy i think that we do we need more women, women in elected office yes but we also need more black men in elected office young black men uh only four members of the, of the new york state legislature are black men under the age of 40 in the new york state legislature wow. four out of 13. so like we 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 it, it's about it's about making sure people know we, we, we highlight what people know, but also inform them on what they don't know. So this leads me to my next question, informing them of what they don't know. 
what what's your agenda or vision for the party uh, togetherness um, um unity um and a lot of things that may sound like cliches but i'll tell you this um cliches are born out of out, out, out of truisms and, and, I, and i believe that if we can if i if we can move the needle a little bit further every day right if and it's like i guess in my as i've gotten older i've learned the value of time um my my dad told me a couple of things that you know you can waste money if you're lucky enough it'll come back you can't waste time like quite literally the second that is past us will never be again Right. Um, and, and you can you can lose material objects, you can lose money, and if and if, if you can figure out how to get those things back, but you can't get time back. And our boroughs lost a lot of time. Uh, we've lost a lot of time because of infighting. We lost a lot of time because of people that simply didn't want to listen to each other. Like right. it's it's it is it it baffles me that as humans. Much forget about political party as humans. I believe that we we fundamentally agree in eighty five percent of the things in the world. Who doesn't it's want a safe place, place to, safe place to live? Who doesn't want food to eat? Who doesn't want their children to be successful in school? That's true. Who, who doesn't want those things? Right. If you can find them, I, I don't know them. I, I, I've never met them. I don't know those folks, right? right. Yeah. The fifteen percent is the medium. It's how do we get there, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like my like when we when we were go to North Carolina and our family reunion before COVID shut everything down. Um, you know, sometimes I like to take 95. And my dad likes to take the Baltimore Washington Parkway. I don't know why he likes to take the Baltimore Washington Parkway. Scenic. I think it's scenic, right? But you know, you, you have all of those um, installation bases and you know, you can't go past, you better, you better go at right at the speed limit because you're going to, you're getting pulled over. You got to relax on the speed if you ever been down on the, on the way south. But also when we we're both trying to get to the reunion. Right, sure. but we got to figure out like we got to have the conversation about that, and and I think that's that's what I think that's what leadership is going to is going to look like in the Bronx going forward, and again it's going to be different. It's going to be relying on a lot of different people. It's going to be relying on people outside of government, right? You have a member of your sorority who is going to be the next vice president of the United States of America. Like like there's, just just think about the gravity of that, right? Think about the gravity of that, that, that somebody who was part of an HBCU, that is part of a, a, a divine nine organization, like that has a different worldview is going to be the vice president of the United States of America. And I'm speaking it into existence. That's what I do. That's what I have to do, right? Like think about the gravity of that, what that yes. means for your membership, what that means for my daughters, what that means for Indian Americans as well. Yeah. Right. Like representation matters. And, and, and I think that like figuring out that leadership, that, that, that when you can bring more voices in the room that are saying things that, you know what, maybe you, maybe it wasn't that you were ignoring them, but by virtue of where you, where you're at and what you know, you just didn't know them. Right. And, and it wasn't willful blindness. You weren't trying to cover your eyes up and say, I don't want, I don't care about this. And put my ears in the, in your, in your hands in my ear. I didn't grow up like that. So I don't know. Right. And that's why we got to get more people with diverse thoughts and diverse um, ideologies to come into the room and figure out what does this borough and this city and this state and this country look like in the next two years, the next four years, the next six years, the next 10 years, right? The census got cut short. Why? Because because this this guy was able to 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 appoint justices to the Supreme Court, right? Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, right? He he he's already had two, and he's on his way to number three. Right. So everybody that wasted a vote for Jill Stein four years ago, and you complain about it now, I want you to understand this is what you did. This is what you did. Yeah. Because you said that Hillary Clinton, a woman, was not qualified enough and she didn't fit every single metric that you wanted it, that you wanted her to fit. So you went away from her, you didn't vote, you, or you voted for Joe Stein, you got this guy in here, and quietly, well, not to us, but a lot of people quietly, he's been making almost just about 300 uh, appointments to the federal bench. Yes. He's made yes. 
lifetime judgeships with people who have no judicial experience. None. Right. None. And the, this is why elections matter. And I went up, and I know I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, <laughs> but, 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 but that just shows how, like, if you don't, if we don't get a handle on our respective areas, um, we will lose ground in ways that we've never lost before. And we will continue to sure. lose ground. Um, a, you think a 6-3, you think a 5-4 majority was bad in the Supreme Court? Yeah. Wait till this lady gets, this, this, this lady gets confirmed. And, and, and it's 6-3. And the erosion of everything that you, that you hold near and dear right. starts to happen vis-a-vis -vis the Supreme Court. Just wait. It's true. Thank you for your tangent, because my, my next question to you is actually about the upcoming general election. So what will the party do in order to get out the vote, either through vote by mail, early voting, um, or on election day? What, what is the party going to do? So what we've been doing since I've, since I've been there, we, we've held phone banks every week. Uh, we have a Wednesday phone bank. Um, but um, we've been doing something every Wednesday. Um, we've been calling in for Biden and, and, the, and the results have been pretty, pretty solid, but there's always more that we can do. Um, we, we've, you know, we can't mail it out because there are, there are prohibitions on utilizing the mail during general elections. And I have a general election coming up, so I'm not permitted to utilize the mm -hmm. mail to do that because, you know, it, it is the use of center resources in an impermissible and improper way. So, and, mm -hmm. I, and I agree with that. However, we're not, we're not prohibited from utilizing social media. Um, I, I utilize my social media to remind people that November 3rd is when we stop voting. Because a lot of people look at election day as when, you, as, oh, that's when we go to vote. No, 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 that, that's, that is the last day to vote, right? You gotta, we gotta start thinking about election day as, um, as, as Christmas Eve, right? That's the last day you can go shopping for Christmas, right? It's the last day, right? I'm sorry, what day was that again? <laughs> Christmas Eve? Wait, are you Christmas Eve? Is that is that your birthday? No, no, no. I was just I, I wanted to hear November third again. <laughs> an end of an error. The end of an error. E R R O R, as well as E R K. Right. It's, right. That, that's what we have to do, right? Because look, like early voting, and this and this is the importance of state legislatures, right? Um, the New York State Senate has been run by Republicans for forever until, you know, like only a two year period um, that was in the middle, in 2009, um, in, in which we were, we were, even in those two years, look how productive Senator Hassel Thompson and everybody out there was in those two years, right? 2018, we win the majority. The very first bill on the very first day of session that we're passing bills was a bill to, um, to, to enact early voting in New York State. That was the first thing we did as a new legislature. The very first thing we did, Senator Zelnor Myrie, a, another young black man out of Brooklyn. Yes. First bill we did, early vote. That shows you what we were about. That set the stage as to what we were about. And now because of Zelnor and because of the folks in, 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 the, in the legislature, we now have early voting you can with your local boards of elections and you have to check in with, the, with, your, with where you're registered to figure out what your early voting poll sites would be because they may differ from your regular poll site. So it's important for, for, for you to be able to, um, to check in. And this is one of these things that I'm going to say, right? And this is not a popular thing to say, but I'm going to say it in. And here it is. Brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, non-binary individuals, we need you to meet us part of the way. If you can't meet us halfway, we'll go 75%, we'll go 90%, but there has to be some sort of way where you meet us. This is what I mean. Um, I routinely put on social media um, about voting or when you can register to vote. October 9th was the deadline, when the census deadline was. Um, and where the poll sites would be. And unfortunately, I know that that reach is, is, is limited to some degree, right? We send out mail before the, before the, the, the prohibition come, kicks in. We, we, we make phone calls. We do everything that we possibly can to inform people. However, as Donna well knows, because she's traveled every block of it, 
<laughs> I represent 318,000 plus people in the 36th Senatorial District. And as the chair of the Democratic Party in the, in the Boogie Down Bronx, there are 1.4 million Bronxites, roughly 800 to 900,000 of them are, are registered Democrats, if they're, you know, right? Overwhelmingly Democrat. There is no possible way that I am able to communicate to every single person. I just can't reach them. I just can't do it on my own. However, however, we play the game of telephone with memes. We play the game of telephone with nonsense that has nothing to do with it. Like we, when verses is happening, I know we all tweet about all the verses that like we, and we, and we know it when the sneakers are coming out, we're able to effectively communicate for things that I don't want to call them nonsense, but they are not as important as the election of my grandchildren. Why do I say my grandchildren when my kids are six and three? Because this <laughs> is how serious this election is, yes. right? So if we can share that, share other things. Now, as an elected official, I, 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 I pledge to you that, that I should be doing more, right? I can do more than the average individual. But there's only but so much do, to do because we have, we have finite bu budgets and we have finite um, universes of, of individuals that we can reach out to. But between the four of us on this call right now, I'm willing to bet that we have the reach of at least 2,000 people. Like, I, and, and it doesn't mean that you can, we, we're each going to call 500 people. But if we text five people right now and say, what's your plan to vote? Text five people and what's your plan? Ask them what, what's your plan to vote? Look and just just, just listen. And just, just let's 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 keep it honest, right? When we text them, right? We know we want to feel special. Don't send the blanket. Hey, hey, y'all! Don't forget to get out and vote. Take the extra six seconds and personalize the text. Write the person's name because that shows that you care enough to ask them what's your plan to vote. Can you ask somebody else to vote, Donna? Can you ask somebody else to vote, Dion? Or, hey, can you ask somebody else to vote? So I'm saying the same thing, but I, there's, a, there's a level of, of, of personality in, in, in saying that I'd like for you to do this because I'm asking you, right? And so I, I think that's one of the things that, that, that's critical about your plan to vote. Figure out where you're registered to vote at, where your poll site is. Um, you can, we can, we can figure that out depending on whether you're in Mount Vernon or the Bronx. Um, you can do that in my offices here to reach out to and to, to assist you with. Um, and that's one of the things that we definitely are happy to do, help you figure out your registration. Some people are, 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 are more closed off with their personal information. And so I get it and we can just give you the website and you can go to the website or you can call the local boards, but make your plan to vote, make your plan to tell as many people as you possibly can that they have to vote um, because the sidelines are not an option this year. The soul of our country is on the ballot. The Supreme Court's on the ballot. Women's reproductive rights are on the ballot. Um, Black people's lives have always been on the ballot. They're on the ballot more now ever in this year. And if we don't recognize now that, that the vote is important, but it's not just a vote, Dion, it's the follow through after the vote, right? It, it is, all right, by the grace of God, January comes around. We have the first um, black woman to be the VP. We have Joe Biden as the, uh, the commander in chief. What, we, what shifts to, it doesn't, we don't, we don't do George Bush on the USS whatever and say, and say uh, mission complete, right? Mission accomplished. We say, okay, now you're in there, what's up? How are we going to continue to improve our democracy? And it's the same thing I expect in my constituents. You passed um, the repeal of 50A. What does that mean? What does that mean for transparency going forward, right? You passed these criminal justice reform bills. What does that mean going forward? We have to be more critical, we have to be better and more critical consumers of information, right? Like, because we're a nation of headline readers, right? We don't read the story anymore. Not oh. us, but the policy in general. We don't, we don't, we don't do it. Wow. My next question for you, and I hope that perhaps you can shed some light on this. So will the Committee for Police Reforms include the 
average citizen? If so, how will they be selected and or how can someone apply? So, so that's that's municipality by municipality. That so the governor set out a mandate by next April first that um, that police departments throughout the state have to set they have to you know more or less get up to speed with changes in times or be changed yeah. by them, right? So, for example, I'm I'm one of the co-chairs on the Mount Vernon's uh, police reform committee, and Mayor Sean Patterson Howard, in addition to other to other members in Mount Vernon, they've selected members of the public in addition to other elected officials. It is up to um, the, each municipality on, on how they select them. Uh, the city of New York, the NYPD, they are going around doing their listening tours in each region of each borough. I think Southeast Queens was tonight or yesterday. Well, I think it's tonight or something of a sort. I saw it on social media. Um, and, and it's one of those things where each municipality is coming up with, with their own way to, um, with, their, with their own way to, to, to figure out um, exactly um, how to go about those things. I, I would, I would, ask people when they think about police reform and to think about police reform from a holistic perspective. Um, as the sponsor of a good majority of the police reform legislation that we've seen passed, I can tell you that I am not an anti-police person. And anybody that knows me, that's ever spoken to me, they can tell you that. And anybody that would say otherwise is blatantly lying for political gain. And I will say that here. However, what I am going to say is this. Um, there are major errors that have been committed by, by, by police and, and there has been a lack of accountability for it um, to the public. And so the legislation that we've, we've done is to create and to foster more public trust in the police. It is not to vilify or demonize or to disrespect our sisters and brothers in law enforcement because we all know people who are members of law enforcement. Yeah. And those folks by and large at a more than 90 something percent clip, do the right thing because they're in it for the right reasons because they care. However, just like any other profession, when there are negative aspects of individuals, right, or negative individuals, individuals who have negative aspects about them or who have conducted less than positive, less conducted themselves in less than positive manner, we have to figure out who are you and how do we get you out? Because it's not about bad apples spoiling the bunch. As, I, as I've said in the past, and I think that this is an analogy that bears worth repeating, if you keep seeing bad apples, bad apples don't really just, just spoil the bunch. If I, if I go to the store every time, right? And every time I wanna buy apples, the apples are spoiled. It's not about them spoiling the, blunt, the bunch. I, at some point, will just stop going to purchase apples. It's not about bad apples spoiling the bunch. It makes you not want to buy apples. It's not about not, not trusting police. It's about when they do so many things, it makes people like, just look at them like, man, I don't, I don't want, I don't, I don't mess with police. Right. I don't, I don't, nah. But the crazy thing is that when you go to urban centers, the centers where they, there seems to be the most anti-police animals, when we go to schools and we speak to children in schools at career days, and Dion, you're an educator and you can probably attest to this, when you speak to young folks, a police officer is still one of those professions that young people aspire to do because they believe it to be noble, because they believe it to be a position in which they can protect their communities. We have to figure out a, a, a way to have communications, and I'm always been some. I've always been somebody who's willing to listen to um, all sides because when we say both sides, it really trivializes it because there's never just two sides to right. to a story. It's right. always a circular feeling of things that have happened in and out of context, which makes which make other people believe that certain things are taking place that may be happening or they may not be happening. Right. But again, my perspective is our perspectives are uniquely and individually our own. Thank you. Speaking of both sides, Senator Bailey, um, how do you think the two parties would work to build and maintain cohesiveness or at least tolerance throughout the various ethnic groups within New York City and the surrounding counties? Um, I would say that, and I, and I think that serving in the minority taught me some really good lessons. 
um, even when we don't have the, 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 the power to change things per se, um, you learn how to understand that people are people are people. What, is, what does that mean, right? Um, so Tuesday nights in Albany, um, we, we tend to play basketball at the state police gym, right? Um, I was playing basketball with a lot of Republicans, a lot of people who, who, I, who I would not necessarily uh, agree with at all um, on policy. But I got to know Fred Akshar and, 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 and Joe Robach and um, John Bonasek and Phil Boyle and, you know, and Jim Tedisco and Andy Lanza. And none of these guys I agree with on policy by large. Just maybe, maybe Boyle and Lanza a little bit, right? Sometimes Joe Robach. But like, like, me and Fred don't agree with anything on policy. But when I lost my mother-in-law due to COVID-19, Fred was one of the first people to reach out to me. Um, John Flanagan reached out to me. Phil Boyle reached out to me. Andy Lanza reached out. These are people who, who, who believed in, who know me as a person. And once you, once you get past like this partisan divide, you get back to the 85% that I talked about earlier. And you're like, you know what? It's a decent person, man. So we got to understand people are people. That doesn't mean we don't defend our ideals now. Okay. I will never back away from what I believe. I will never back down from, from the ideals that I believe. However, um, I, I will simply say that when you're looking at people, and, and, and like, I, like when I got the, um, when I became chair, Phil, Phil Boyle said, text me, hey, Mr. Chairman, hope you, have, hope you still have time for basketball, right? And, and, and again, this is, this is a Republican who we don't vote on the same things, right? And, and, and I think there can be a way to get things done uh, without vilifying the others. Understanding people being people, I think is, is the way that we get through partisan divides and gridlock. Um, obviously when, when you have less of a majority, it is incumbent upon the majority party to work well with the minority party because you know, you don't have a, a clear, you don't have a clear uh, divide, right? In, in New York State, right, we have, the, the assembly has a supermajority. Um, we have a democratic governor and the Senate, we're nearing a supermajority. Um, so it's, it's one of these things where numerically you may not need to deal with people, but that doesn't mean that you should do that, right? Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do something, Absolutely. right? And, and, I, and I think that when you're, when, you're, when you're involving yourself in government and you're involving yourself in legislating, taking things into consideration from other folks, I think is not just valuable, it's necessary. I'm a kid from the Bronx. What do I know about farming from in upstate? What do I know about that? <laughs> I don't. And, and, and I have to rely on people who are professionals or residents of the area. Or vice versa, don't come from a certain area, start talking about the Bronx and Mount Vernon and how they're this and they're that. And if you haven't set foot here, ask me, ask us how we feel about that. And when we have those conversations, I think that's how we get through partisan divide as opposed to rhetoric and just speaking just to get likes and retweets in our echo chambers. Of course. Um, and I want to thank you for that. Um, we've actually come to the end of our Q&A section, Senator Bailey, but I do want to ask you if you have any final words, any push for some uh, voting enthusiasts or those who are lacking the enthusiasm. Um, if you can just share some final few words for us. So we, I'm gonna put it out there in a the line like this, right? 2008, um, I went to vote at St. Luke's uh, Episcopal Church on 222nd Street. That was my voting site at that time. I stood in the line for an hour and 45 minutes. And it was the best hour and 45 minutes that I'd ever spent on any line in my life because we elected Barack Obama to be the president of the United States of America. I had a great feeling that day because I knew that it would come out in our favor. Our not just being black folks, our being the United States of America because we had a chance to turn the page. Mm -hmm. We have a chance to turn an equally as significant page, if not more significant. The consequences are far too great for us to even fathom. So if you have the ability to get to the polls, get there. If you've requested your absentee ballot, request it. But wherever you're at, just Go vote, because my grandfather, James T. Bailey from Johnson County, North Carolina, 
came up here. He was born 1929. He died in 2011. He told stories about like people not being able to vote. My great, 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 My great grandmother. grandmother, Sylvia Richardson Holder, she was born into slavery. We're not that far removed. You have people in my family who were born into slavery without the right to vote. We don't have the time. You don't have the time. I, I just, I, I don't know what else to say. I don't know else how to say it, but, but just, just, just stop playing. Get up and vote. Go out and do it. And Senator Bailey, I think you've said it all. I want to thank you for that. That was, um, that was a nice way to end our, our little chat. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our president, Donna Joseph, to close us out. Thank you again. Senator Bailey, thank you for your, your passion and um, spending that afternoon with us to educate our community. 2008 was a big election, but this one definitely is uh, a fierce election that we can't play with. So thank you for spending time with us this afternoon.